Fantastic. Well, what a great series that it's been uh, the last four weeks. We had Elspeth Darley, who's been heading this up. We had Kate Middleton last week, who was visiting with us. We've looked at Remain, Restore, Refuel, and Kate finishes off last week, where I'm going to pick up today on relationships. And this is all about positive mental health. And I've entitled it <clears throat> Better Together. I've drawn from an old message by John Orberg, which I found very helpful on this subject. And I want to just remind you, the emphasis is on positive mental health. By the way, we've got Colchester, Bury St. Edmunds, and lots of people from prisons joining us today. So why don't we give them a round of applause, because they are connecting with us. We're glad you're here. If you've been a Christian for any time, no matter whether it's just weeks, I think you will probably have heard this verse mentioned. It's the first not good in the Bible. And some of you, right, right, you know what that is. The first time it's mentioned something is not good. It's found in Genesis 2, verse 18. Let me read it to you. The Lord God said, so it was God who noticed, it is not good for mankind, the human being, to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper. Now, we don't know from that passage in Genesis 1 and 2 there how that not good manifested. We don't know whether Adam, and I'm reading into the passage, you just don't know whether he was downcast, whether there was something about his demeanor, demeanor whether he was miserable. What emotion did Adam suffer at that moment so that God noticed, notice it was God who noticed, and it was God who provided the answer, so if you're downcast, if there's something that's not good in your life, there's an ever-present help in time of need, and he notices. Hello, that's at least three of you are happy about that. He notices, and he noticed this, and it was God who provided the answer. In, the, in my research, I read a, a, a magazine called the Jewish Herald Voice, and the rabbis speak about this passage, and this is what the rabbis ask. Why was Adam lonely? After all, he had the angels to talk to. Now, there's no record of him talking to the angels, but that's what the rabbis say, so I'm just mentioning it. The angels would do anything for him. That was true. But man, Adam, could not do anything for them. He was not needed. The angels did not need anything from him. Therefore, they say he was lonely. He had to be able to help others to make sure his contributions were worthwhile. He had to be needed. And then they define loneliness in this way. Loneliness means you are not needed. Now, God, Adam had everything around him. They say about the angels, but he had all the animals. If any of you are animal lovers, God bless you. Adam had all the animals around him. I don't know whether he had his own pet dog or cat or whatever. Probably not a cat because they're of the devil. But he had, he had a dog. <laughs> And, and, he, and he was able to walk and talk with God. And yet, it's not good that he's alone. But he had all this. But something was affecting him negatively. He was alone. And loneliness means you are not needed. Here's my, my first point. In fact, to be honest, this is really my only point today. This is a one-point sermon, but there may be a few sub-points that come from it. Here's my first point. You and I, you and I were created for community. You and I were made for community. We need to be needed. And we're talking about positive mental health, and I'll go through it. But if we're to have a positive mental health, you will need, and this is to varying degrees with all of us, but you will need to connect with community. Now, I've heard people beat themselves up about this. Here's a couple of statements I've heard people say. I wish I wasn't so needy. It helps me, someone said this to me, it helps me to be around people, but I don't want to be a drain. That was said to me by a young lady in this, well, she was young in comparison to me, in this church. She said, I, I feel when I come here, this is my safe place. She used to come to the Friday Hub to begin with. She said, I just feel this is my, my safe place. And then she started to come on a Sunday. And often she'd say to me, oh, I feel so safe here. And, and I remember talking with her. And then she got baptized. And we rejoiced with her. And she was following Jesus and part of our community. 
Then a few weeks went by and I didn't see her. And then I got a message. She'd committed suicide. And I was gutted. Because she said this was a safe place. Why didn't she tell someone? In this safe environment, in this community that she'd found from the Friday hub leading into the Sunday services and in a small group, why hadn't she told somebody? And yet she'd said to me, I don't want to be a drain. Listen, <laughs> we're all needy. We're all needy. This is a level playing field here. We're all needy. We all need other people in our lives. Do not beat yourself up from that. It's in our very DNA, the need for community. We will not flourish. We will not thrive without connecting somewhere in community. Let me read to you some figures. This is according to the Campaign to End Loneliness. They say over a million older people in the UK are chronically lonely. Now, then we immediately think, oh, yeah, it's an older person's issue. Then this is what they're going to say. This is the end, campaign to end loneliness. But this problem doesn't just impact the elderly. 53% of 18 to 34-year-olds also struggle with loneliness. And then they detail from research how loneliness affects your physical and mental well-being. How it's harder, it's proven. Lonely people, I quote, lonely people are less able to fight off viruses and if they do, they do get sick, their bodies are slower to recover. And you think, oh, it's just about common cold and things. No, 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 listen, carry on. This is the article. Loneliness and social isolation are risk factors for coronary heart disease and stroke, two of the leading causes of premature death in the UK. All of these things, they write, combined mean that social isolation and loneliness are linked with a 30% higher risk of an early death. We need community to thrive. If we're to flourish as human beings, we need community. Now, here's the question that comes to my mind, and I want to ask it of you, and then I'll, I'll give you the answer, because <laughs> I asked it of myself. Why is this such... A need. Why did God put this desire and requirement for community in us so that we might flourish and thrive? Well, this is why I believe God gave us that. Because you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. And God is community. God is community. Theologians of old used to call him a divine society. When God is first mentioned in the creation account that we read from Genesis, the word that is used for God is the word Elohim. And that is a plural masculine term, masculine term which means more than one. So when he says, let's make man, he says, let's make man in our image. This is pointing to the importance of the Trinity because the Trinity is community. Three distinct, it's mysterious, three distinct persons, yet one. There is such a unity and togetherness and community amongst them that nothing can separate them. They're not stuck in any kind of competition. They never ask the question, who's the most wise or who's the most omnipresent or who's the most whatever. There's this co-equality. They're one and yet three. They are a Community, And this is really important. Because when we attack community, we're attacking something that is at the core and heart of God. Because it's who he is. God is one. It's one of the statements that Israel was meant to make. There's something important about the understanding that God is one. God has been experiencing fellowship. And friendship ever since, well, I mean, said since Adam was a lad, but that doesn't work, does it? Ever since, <laughs> ever since God, <laughs> forever, he has enjoyed fellowship and community. And when he created humanity, don't think, oh, he looked around because he saw Adam was alone and he looked at Jesus and he said, I, I feel a bit lonely too. 
And the Holy Spirit, do you feel lonely? They never had that conversation. They didn't create humanity because they felt lonely, that there was something missing in them. They crazy created humanity because they wanted to share the love. Hello? They wanted, we, we've got this beautiful harmony. We've got this great synergy. We're distinct, yet we're one. We enjoy our friendship and our fellowship. We walk with one another and talk with one Are we going to keep this to ourselves? No. Let's make someone in our image. Someone that's like us. And can I tell you, brothers and sisters, and those of you watching online as well, and your brothers and sisters, maybe you're not, maybe you don't know Jesus, but wherever you're looking, I have never got over the fact that every human being, this is, a, this is a revelation. It's not just something you learn in the Bible. You see it. And suddenly your eyes are opened. Every human being that you set eyes upon, there is something godlike about them. There is. Josh, you remind me of God. I mean it. You, David, you remind me of God. There is something godlike about you. Whoever's online, Mary, Martha, don't change those names. Joseph, Mary, Lazarus, if you watch you. you there's something about you that is godlike. Just turn to the person next to you and say, You remind me of God. Remember, this was not, I've got so much to say today. Remember, this was not out of God's need, this was out of God's love. He created humanity. In his image and likeness, we need one another because we're like God in his image and likeness. Jesus said it in this way. Listen to this. My prayer is not for them alone. That was for his disciples he prayed for. This is John 17. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. Are you a believer? Yeah. Hip, hip. Yeah, some of you are excited, but others of you aren't. If you're a believer... This is what Jesus prayed for you. That all of them may be one. All of them. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So the same connection that the Father and the Son have, he wants us to enjoy. May they also be in us that the world may believe that you've sent me. Hold on. It's not just so as that we may flourish, but it's so as the world may flourish. Community is for our sake, but it's for their sake. It's for the world's sake. He wants them all to believe that you sent me. And then he goes on. I've sent them the glory that you gave me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. One argument that often broke out about around the disciples, around Jesus, was who's the greatest? Can I sit on the right? Can he sit on the left when you get into your glory, Lord? I think it was Muhammad Ali. Remember the famous boxer who used to use that term, I am the greatest. Some of you heard the story when he got on a plane and he refused to wear the seatbelt because he said to the flight attendant, I'm Superman, and Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which she said to him, Superman don't need no aeroplane. <laughs> you and I are not superhumans. We're human. We need one another. And when we insist on our own way or take credit for group accomplishments or walk away hurt because we weren't consulted, we're struggling with this kind of self-centeredness and self-glorification. But in the Trinity, you never get that. I haven't got time to go into this, but there's an essay written by a guy called uh, Dale Brunner, or Brunner, all about the shyness of the Godhead. You can Google it. And when he talks about shyness, he's not, he's not talking about the shyness that is self-centered that we often experience He's, talk, he's not talking about a timidity, a fear. He's talking about a, 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 a shyness of other-centeredness, of what the Bible calls preferring one another. And Dale Bruner suggests this, that if we were to have a, a, a whiteboard and draw a stick person on it, so imagine there's a whiteboard in front of me, stick person, should have brought this on, shouldn't I? That the Holy Spirit 
is like this. If that person represents Jesus, the Holy Spirit will be behind the board. You won't see him, but you'll feel him and you'll hear him. And there'll be this hand that's coming round and saying this, look at Jesus. Listen to Jesus. He's the way, the truth, the life. And what he points out is the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they have this shyness, which is not timidity. It's an other-centeredness. It's preferring one another. And the Holy Spirit points to Jesus. And Jesus says, if I've come to glorify myself, it's not worth nothing. I glorify the Father. And when you hear the Father speak, there's only two times recorded for us, one in the bapti- on his, Jesus' baptism, one on the Mount of Transfiguration. And God the Father speaks from heaven. And do you know what he says? Look at Jesus, effectively. This is my beloved son and I'm who, who I'm well pleased. Jesus, the father doesn't say, oh, well, and, and don't forget to listen to me, will you? Uh, don't, don't forget me. He's not worried about us forgetting. If we look at Jesus, we won't forget the father. If we listen to the Holy Spirit, we won't forget the son. And all of this, this community of the Godhead is pointing to one another and lifting each other up and glorifying one another. Can I just say this in community? We will not thrive by making it all about me. It's not about me. It's about us. It's about you and 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 you. It's about preferring one another. Let me give two points in this last nine minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do call to Can I say this, number one? Remember, you are never alone. You are never alone. Now, I'm focusing this particularly on community and our importance of our togetherness. But our community flows out of our connection to God. Honestly, the most beautiful society on the face of God's earth is the church of Jesus Christ. It is the hope of the world. And so, we have this because of our connection to God. And I just want to remind you, God is a person. Jesus is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. You say, well, how can they be? It's not about a physical body. It's about the personality. It's about Genesis 1. Because when we're made in the image and likeness of God, it doesn't mean God has a body. It means we have moral, intellectual, even creative factors that are not the same as God that we create from nothing. But there's something that's so God-like about us because we reflect the Godhead. We reflect Him in whose image we are made. So never forget, always remember, whatever situation, I wish I, that young lady that took her life, I wish she'd connected with us, but I would have told her as well, in the middle of the night when you feel alone, you are not alone. Let me just show you a little clip. I was, I was on Instagram, I was on Instagram at that point, I'm back on after holiday, and I hate it, but I'm back on. I've just, I've just, grown, I've just grown totally out of love with social media, but nevertheless. Um, that's not for you to really know about. That's just for me to tell you. And um, this, I caught this just before I was preparing it to remind us we're never alone. Look at this from Michael Jr. Yo, comedian Michael Jr. here. As you know, I just flat out enjoy doing comedy. But one of the things I love way more than that is being a dad. Not too long ago, I'm going through some video footage and I run into this video of my youngest daughter being born. Now, of course, I was there. I actually took the video, but I had never really experienced it from this perspective before. Now, look, we're in the hospital room. She's uh, sticky, and she's baby and all that stuff, and she's in the middle of crying. And then I speak up. I start talking to her, and watch how she responds when she hears my voice. Okay, Portland, look, look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay. It's okay, I'm right here. Right here, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, baby, it's okay. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> so check it. A few minutes later, uh, the nurse starts working on her, puts her pamper on her, and uh, I'm not saying anything, and she actually starts to cry again. Then I speak up, she hears my voice, and stops crying, like again. But I want you to notice what else happens 
after I tell her that I love her. Portland, it's okay. It's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. That's just phenomenal. I'm like, whoa. Here's the thing. We'll always have times where we're not as comfortable, probably even to the point of tears, where life is just heavy. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice. Because he is trying to talk to you. And I can tell you what he wants you to know is that he loves you. All you got to do is open your eyes. Happy Father's Day. Uh, I assume that's an applaud for me finding that. <laughs> All you got to do is know the Father loves you. The Father loves you. The Father loves you. Many of our mental health battles come down to fear. As a child, I had lots of fears. My dad prayed for me every day. I've, you've heard it before, some of you. When we pray for our Steve, it is unreasonable fears. I've realized as I've got older that every fear I had actually has a, a technical term to it. I did suffer with agoraphobia. That's one we all know, but I had a fear as a child or into my teenage years of foul smells. I had to have a polo mint in my mouth to smell the mint because if any other smell came, I was immediately physically sick. And honestly, being in a school full of boys, there was a lot of foul smells around. <laughs> Apparently, I, I might not say this wrong, but that was called bromidrophobia, fear of odors. I had that. I had a fear of buttons. It is a real fear. I didn't like the touch of buttons. I didn't like the texture of buttons. Again, I would be physically sick. That is called, if I'm going to get the pronunciation right, compoundophobia. I don't know whether that's right, Dr. Jonathan, at the back, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> my dad had so many fears. He got lost in Cambridge one time. He's probably in his late 70s and he was coming back from Newmarket having visited an uncle. This was before ever there was uh, sat nabs, although he probably wouldn't have used one anyway. Anyway, and I got this phone call at home. We're lost, we're lost. Steve, we're lost. And he was only by Cambridge Airport. And I drove out to meet him. We, we live in Milton. He was in Cambridge. And when I, when I saw him, is, I remember the colored T-shirt he had on. It was like an orangey, mustardy color. It was drenched in sweat. And he came up to me and hugged me. The sweat. It wasn't a hot day. It was the fear of being lost. He's three miles away. But it gripped his heart. And I hugged him. I said, you're okay. We need to know God is with us wherever we go. We also need to feel the hug of the individual around us that says, I'm with you. I am with you. My first point is nowhere in community. My second point was remember you're never alone. My first point, third point as I close is this. Reach out. Go on. Be vulnerable. Reach out to others. It's going to take honesty it's going to take a risk. And uh, hear me, I'm going to talk about just the C3 church because this isn't the only community. If you feel lonely, there's a place for you here. But when you reach out, some people in this congregation will accept you and others will reject you. Sorry, because we ain't perfect yet. And you know what? There's some people in this church and all they ever talk to is each other. 
and they keep themselves to themselves and you may try and move into their community and they won't let you in. <coughs> My voice is breaking. And they won't let you in because they're not perfect yet. Or someone might be so busy that when you talk to them, when you've got jobs to do on a Sunday, you, for, you, you forget to stop and listen and really concentrate on the person because we're not perfect yet. But I know this with my Noah. <laughs> There's a place for you here because God sets the lonely in families. God puts the isolated in community. So there will be somewhere. Oh, and please, don't think that's got to be everyone. If I get sick in hospital... God forbid, you don't all have to come and see me. All right? I won't be able to cope with you all coming. Well, please, two or three of you come. That'll do with my family. Just two or three of you. Bring me some grapes. Don't know what they have, uh, healing powers, but if you're allowed, don't bother with the flowers. They're not allowed in anymore, and I have a few allergies. If you want to come, give me a check. That's fine. Whatever you want to do, if you still do that. I don't need... Community isn't about knowing everyone. Although I have found this, that when a church grows, and boy, are we a small church. Everyone tells me we're big. We're not. But I've found this, that God gives you a capacity to embrace more people into your life. Colchester, Barry St. Edmunds, we love you. You didn't exist a couple of years ago. You were not even a twinkle in our eyes. But we love you. There's some people I see when I see them there. And I just, oh, it's so good to see you. Some of you weren't part of this community 12 months ago. Now it feels like you're just family. You're family. So God does expand your capacity. But don't get all, I can't say that word, don't get all uppity. If everyone doesn't know you, just as long as two or three get to know you. We want you as part of us. Now, I've got another video which I can't show you because of time, but it's a great video. See if I can find what it's called in my notes. Uh, no, it's all about small groups and how uh, it's quite funny. In fact, we're going to watch it and I'm going to break the rules. This is what we don't want small groups to be like. One of the best ways you can connect is get involved in community. But this is what we don't want them to be like. Have a look at this. Is your small group a too much information extravaganza? A touchy feely share a A mind numbing theological marathon? Mine was. That's why I created the world's first openly shallow small group. Here's how. Do you guys believe the promises of God are real? Yes, in my own life. I'm sorry, I really... sorry, it's my bad. I, let me rephrase that. Yes or no, does anyone believe the promises of God are real? You must be ever vigilant. Nothing kills a shallow small group quicker than people opening up and sharing their feelings. Asking questions that foster discussion, mm, that's a big no-no. True or false, you had a good day today. So on a scale of one to two, a, Jesus, B, Jesus and the devil, with two being strongly agree and one being strongly disagree. So if the whale is traveling at 10 miles an hour and it spews Jonah at seven miles an hour, does anyone know the capital of North Dakota? Anyone? Somebody give me an adverb. <laughs> if heartfelt and genuine conversation rears its ugly head, hey, buddy. <laughs> Well, it's time to move quickly to rid your small group of it. So that's how I interpret it. I mean, I'm not a theologian or anything, but... No, nope, you're not. Well, I, I had this verse that's been on my heart. Really? O on your heart? Like just sitting there on your left ventricle? I really just wanted to share that... Fire drill, people! Small group fire drill! Find your exits now! Let's go! People. Even at prayer time, you can't let your guard down. So, does uh, anyone have a brief, generic prayer request? They can cover and say 20 seconds. Uh, my co-worker's mother... Too specific. Someone I know has been diagnosed... Logging with... down. Logging down. This person is really scared. When I said brief, I wasn't talking about my underwear. Person, uh, people sick. Ah, oh, that's good. Anybody want to say a prayer for sick people? No one? I'll do it. Amen. 
All right, let's go eat. <laughs> Be strong, shallow small group leader. If people push you to go deeper, just remind them, crazy people don't go off the shallow end. No, they go off the deep end. Shallow small group. Because when things get too deep, people drown. Won't you join us? <laughs> it was Andy Crouch, a theologian, who pointed out, you know, that nakedness is a condition that only applies to human beings. And I've never really thought of that before. You never look at a cow and say, there's a naked cow. Even a sheep that's been shorn, you never look at it and say, there's a naked sheep. But we, we know what it is to be vulnerable. But you won't heal. You won't be all you're meant to be unless you're vulnerable. I preached at a church in Portsmouth a few weeks ago. And one of the things they said about me was, oh, we love your vulnerability. Why not? Anyone here got it all together yet? I need you. I need you to make me a better me. I really do. I need to be inspired by an Andy Gray who stands and worships God on the right hand side of me on a Sunday morning. I need you. Even with your sunglasses on inside. <laughs> he left his prescription glasses in the car. He's holding it. I keep wanting to pray for him for his blind eyes, but I know. I need Ray to come up and pull my leg a little bit about Man United beating Liverpool. And we put out a second-rate team. Who cares? Fourth-rate team. But I need him. I need others to come and comfort me and hug me and support me. We need each other. And my mental health, which has been a battle, will be better for having you in my life. Who are you vulnerable with? Confess your sins to one another so that you might be healed. Some things can't be healed without confession. You need others around you. What sexual sin do you need to confess to someone? Not everyone. I've told you before about the woman who confessed to me she was having lustful thoughts about me. I was driving a car and I was, she was sitting next to me. She said, I've been having lustful thoughts about you. And I just said, that's nice. I didn't know what else to say. I just wanted to get home quick. She didn't need to confess to me about her lustful thoughts about me. Actually, I said, will you marry me? And that's what happened. No, uh, uh, I, I, was, I, was a, I was a joke. It wasn't my wife. It wasn't my wife. I've got to finish because I'm getting naughty now. But I... She, she could have confessed to someone. There was actually, no, no. There was a whole group of them that were struggling. No, there wasn't. She could have just said something to someone. Because we all need someone in our lives. And you'll thrive better. And become the more complete you. Made in the image and likeness of God. In community. Bow your heads, close your eyes. two things I want to pray in Jesus name for everyone here that maybe some are feeling lonely Lord open up the way for them to connect with community both in this church and maybe outside as well because we thank you that it's not just here but there's other places we can find community we pray for all our C3 groups Lord that they will have the problem of being too big because people want to connect with each other in real life be honest and heal in community. I pray that we'll find that in Jesus' name. Amen. Second thing, keep our heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to do the appeal now for knowing Jesus rather than later. If you don't know Jesus, honestly, it's like that video that we saw. Wherever you go, He'll be whispering to you, Catherine, Stephen, I love you. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He doesn't want you to go into an eternity outside of him. Because whatever hell is, it's an absence of God. And he doesn't want you to live this life devoid of a relationship with him because that's not life. I have come to give you life and life in all its fullness. So you can get to know Jesus right now. I'm going to pray a prayer. And at the end of this prayer, if you prayed it for the first time or maybe recommitting, we would love you to raise your hand or if you're online or in one of the other locations, you can raise your hand right now at the end of this prayer and then I'll hand over to the location pastor. So pray this. Barry Colchester, pray it all out loud. We're going to do it all together. In prison, if you're there, pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, today, I give you my life. I hand over the reins. I give you control. Become my Lord. Become my leader. Thank you for your amazing love that was shown on the cross. Thank you for your forgiveness. Give me a new start. From today, I pray. In your name, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Anyone in the room or online, just write yes. Would you raise your hand right now? You prayed that first time or reconnecting with God. Anybody quick, come on before we sing this song of worship. Anybody? Online, write yes. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for all our locations and then hand back to location pastor. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for what we've learned in this service. May we truly be a reflection of that oneness as the church of Jesus Christ that causes others to look in and say, what is it you've got? And what we've got is a unity with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed this video today, why don't you click subscribe and click on that notification bell to get a notification the next time we upload a video. And if you're new or you've been coming to the C3 Church for a little while now, why don't you find out what your next step might be in the journey of faith? Click on the next step link in the description below to find out what your next step in your journey might be.